start, uh, it is a, a tremendous pleasure to have uh, David Pergel, Spergel today uh, talking to us. Professor Spergel is a, a theoretical astrophysicist at Princeton and also the founding director of the Center for Computational Astrophysics of the Sweetheart Institute by the Summers Foundation. He's, um, he received his PhD at Harvard and then he has been at Princeton since then. He is uh, uh, extremely well known uh, for his outstanding contribution to the field uh, of cosmology in his, all his widest aspects. For example, among the many results, he was part of the team uh, that uh, designed, uh, developed, and then uh, brought to completion uh, the science uh, output, the WMAP satellite, which uh, provided a remarkable map uh, of the initial condition of the universe. He's now playing a leading role in the, the Flame satellite that we first. He's also has done remarkable work, work in understanding and actually analyzing the late time large structure that we see in the universe. And he's also done a import, very important contribution in our way to possibly detect that method, for example, through the annual modulation of the sigma. So for this contribution, he received uh, numerous awards. Uh, for example, okay, he was a MacArthur Fellow and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He, he received the, the Show Prize in Astronomy and the Helen Warner Prize in Astronomy and similarly the Heinemann Prize. And uh, in 2014, he was uh, among natural people that count. <laughs> people that count. But uh, very recently, a few months ago, in 2018, he received the Breakthrough Prize uh, in Fundamental Physics for uh, the remarkable uh, contribution that uh, he and the rest of the Denmark team did be, to our understanding of their needs. So, thanks for coming. So, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my plan today is to talk first about the state of cosmology. Where are we today as a field? Uh, what I'm going to want to do is give you a sense that we live in interesting times and the current data is either suggesting some systematics that we don't understand or that uh, there's really new physics there. Then I want to look at some of the ways in which we're going to test that. Say a little bit about some upcoming work we're doing with the uh, Atacama Cosmology Telescope, but then turn to NASA's W first mission. Yes? Would you allow me to come down and push the button Sure, we can push. Go to that level? Good. Okay. And I'll switch to overhead when I show one or two images that are really nice images. And um, then talk about W first. And I'll begin before I get into W first, for those of you who don't follow this, just so you know a little bit of context. This is a mission that has been canceled in the president's 2019 budget. But we have significant amount of congressional support and we are hopeful that we will be able to reverse this. And I think in fact it's quite likely. We live in um, interesting times. Uh, for those of you who have not checked the news in the last 10 minutes, <laughs> um, Rick Perry is no longer head of DOE. <laughs> Do not clap. The lesson we have learned this morning from the State Department and the CIA is it could always get worse. <laughs> okay, so. Last time I think I gave the Stanford Colloquium, I was giving a WMAP talk. And just, you know, for about a decade, I gave the same talk over and over again, which basically said, we have the simple model, it fits not only the microwave background data, but it also fits all this data we have for large scale structure, Hubble constant, everything else. This simple model is very successful. And when, you know, as the Planck data came in, you know, in some ways, at least with the observations of the CMB, I'd say this model has continued to be remarkably successful. Right? This is showing where we were 
with ACT and SBT before the Planck results came in, the WMAP results, and the Planck res results came in and they saw basically, you saw the same model now with higher precision. And uh, you look at the, w, the Planck measurements of temperature and polarization, uh, the Planck measurements of CMB lensing, the BAO acoustic oscillations. What you're seeing here is the same cosmological model, not one fit to this data, but fit to the temperature data I showed on the previous slide. So all the parameters are completely determined. And then you go look at the temperature polarization and the polarization data. And, oh, I can point to each one, don't worry. There's temperature polarization and polarization polarization, gravitational lensing, BAO, all of these showing a consistent cosmological model. And when you get down to parameters, you know, whether you look at WMAP parameters or Planck parameters, you know, they're a pretty consistent story. But in the last couple years, there have been some intriguing discrepancies. And I'm just going to highlight a few of them. One comes from the measurement of the Hubble constant. And this is showing, first in gray, this is from a recent paper from Stephen Feeney, you take the Planck measurements of cosmological parameters from temperature, you can extrapolate to low redshift and predict the Hubble constant today for around 67. The blue curve shows what happens when you take no, no CMB measurements, you take BAO distance ladder measurements calibrated with uh, D, D, D to H rate, measured deuterium to hydrogen ratio, which gives you the baryon to photon ratio, and then use the supernova data where you calibrate the distance to redshift 0 0.6 to 0.4 to calibrate the supernova. And then, without making much assumption about cosmological model, right, the gray model assumes lambda CDM. The blue model just assumes that over this redshift range, the Hubble parameter H of Z can be written in terms of a third order polynomial. It's a smooth function and then insist that it fit the supernova data. And you get something very consistent with lambda CDM. And if all we had were the blue and gray data, we would be triumphant and say we've got a consistent model. But what's intriguing is if you look at the supernova determinations of distance, and there are several other groups have done measurements of H naught from a local distance ladder, they tend to point to a value that's several sigma high. Now this discrepancy is not yet big enough that we would say that the model is ruled out, but it is big enough that it's getting interesting. And it's one of several other interesting discrepancies. You see the same, you see a different kind of discrepancy when you look at measurements of the Hubble constant from uh, galaxies and the Hubble, Hubble constant omega matter based on galaxies and using BAO acoustic oscillations. And this is what you get if you use the Lyman alpha forest BAO acoustic oscillations. And yeah, there's some marginal region they overlap, but it's one of many things in cosmology right now that are off by two to three sigma. And there's just a lot of them. Um, most recently, uh, more recently, the uh, some of the DES results have come in, and this is the value of the amplitude of fluctuations. This is plotted in units uh, that depends on the amplitude and the matter density. This is the matter density. These are the best fit parameters from Planck. This is what, these are the best fit parameters from low redshift. And there are many other ways we have of measuring the amplitude of fluctuations at low redshift, things like uh, Thermos and Yale-Sildovich effects, 
measurements of redshift space distortions. All these measurements tend to give values around 0.78. They're all quite consistent. The Planck values are higher. Now, all of these discrepancies are, depends how you evaluate them. We're looking at them a posteriori, kind of at the two to three sigma level. They're not so significant that we can say absolutely the model's in trouble, but there are more of them than should be if, if we are getting our statistics right. So I think this points to one of several possibilities. Uh, the most exciting of which is new physics. Um, one interpretation that people have put forward for this data is that the equation of state of the dark energy, uh, we usually talk about this in terms of W, the ratio of the pressure to the density, which goes into the expansion factor of the universe as, you know, how, it, it, how the density varies with the expansion factor, where W equals zero is matter, W equals minus one is a vacuum energy or a cosmological constant. And if you have a value of W less than minus one, it's a very strange universe. It's one in which the dark energy grows with time. In fact, the dark energy can grow so rapidly that eventually the universe is torn apart in a big rip. And not only are galaxies torn apart, but eventually atoms and nuclei themselves, and then oh, everything is destroyed in a finite time. Now, if you took every observation at face value, some of them will, and some combinations of them, for example, you take what I think are some of the most precise and uh, carefully done measurements we have, Planck and DES, combine just them, you get W equals minus 1.3 um, with a four sigma deviation from W equals minus one. Now it doesn't fit lots of other stuff. I wouldn't panic yet, but I will note that I did get interviewed by new uh, scientists in, uh, around November 1st of 2016, and they asked me what I thought about the big rip, and I thought this big rip universe was perhaps consistent with the data, physically possible, but pretty ugly and extremely unlikely. Some, this, and as I said in the, at that moment, that was my view of the Trump presidency. <laughs> so, you know, based on recent experience, um, I suspect the universe will be torn apart reasonably soon. <laughs> uh, in a big rip. But I think the real lesson here is, well, twofold. One, we need more data. We're, you know, there, I think uh, a lot of non-cosmologists have looked at the success of the standard model, the success of WMAP and then Planck, and feel that cosmology's done. We've got it all figured out. Um, given that we don't know what dark energy is, we don't understand dark matter, we dearly don't understand the mechanisms that produced inflation. We've got, I don't think we're done yet. But even if we didn't have these deep questions, I think we are in a situation where th th things are intriguing. And it's worth getting more precise measurements. And what I think should be a theme as we think about the next set of measurements is that we're getting to such levels of sensitivity that we will likely, almost certainly, be limited by our systematic errors rather than our statistical ones. So it's very important as we think about all sets of future observations that we work to do our best to make sure that they are not systematics limited. And there's a bunch of new data sets that are coming. Um, I'm gonna talk about, a little about this CMB stream here of improving data focusing on data from Advanced Act, but Advanced Act will be succeeded in a few years by the Simons Observatory. 
which we hope to have in the sky around 2020. And hopefully around 2025, we're looking at CMBS4 as we go on to the next generation of experiments. And right now, we'll have data from DES and HSC. And the data that I showed you is just the DES first year data. The DES team has much more data in the can, and they're working on analyzing it now. Uh, HSC is just now starting to get interesting cosmological results. And we'll, you know, looking towards the next decade, we should have precision data from Euclid and LSST at the beginning of the decade, and hopefully W first at the middle of ne the next decade. We'll improve spectroscopy. But there's also a lot of other astronomical observations that are improving. Uh, so, for example, the distance scale, one of the most intriguing discrepancies is between measurements of the Hubble constant based on local distance scale and the cosmological one, is about to improve significantly because of a, a European mission called Gaia. Gaia is doing, you know, in many ways, the most classical thing in astronomy, astronomy, astrometry, measuring the distance to stars. Gaia represents a tremendous improvement over previous data sets. It's really about a hundredfold improvement in accuracy for distance. And at the same time, the number of stars to which you have distances measured is growing by a thousandfold. So we'll have measurements of distances to a billion stars. And there's been a preliminary Gaia data release based on one epoch of observations. The second data release is coming in April. And with that, we will have much more accurate measurements of distances to Cepheids, the first step in the distance ladder. And with that improved calibration, the measurements of the uncertainties in the Hubble constant should drop significantly. And you know, I think one of two things will happen. Either the error bars will get smaller and stay around the same value and the discrepancies will get worse, or with improved data, it will slide towards the Planck value. But we'll see, and we'll see very soon. Um, I'm going to begin by saying a bit about the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. It's a telescope located in the Atacama Desert at a height of about 5,200 meters, or about 17,000 feet. And uh, from there, you can see about two-thirds of the sky can be observed. What it represents is because we have a bigger telescope, this is from our 2016 paper, you can see that you can observe the temperature fluctuations with much higher resolution. This lets you see things like these clusters of galaxies and these point sources that are not so easily visible in Planck. It also remeasures the temperature fluctuations at high L. But most importantly, with its improved sensitivity to polarization, will make accurate measurements of temperature and polarization. And with advanced ACT, we've now scanned a very significant fraction, you can see shown here, of the sky. Close to about half the sky has been observed. See if I pull this off correctly. Yeah, so this is some of the, we can zoom around in the data. So we've got a lot of sky. And if we go back and forth, there's the Planck data. There's Planck plus ACT. You can see, see that ACT fills in, for temperature, the, the high L results. You can also see that the data sets are very consistent with each other at the, at the visual level, like this. And though here we've actually filtered both of them so that we're using whatever one is le least noisy in a given reason. And uh, with that, we should be able to make more accurate measurements of cosmological parameters. So this shows, based on the data we have from 2013 to 2015, not even counting our 2016 and 2017 data, how accurately we can determine the basic parameters relative to the Planck temperature combination. And you can see with our 13 to 15 data, we should basically do as well as Planck, 
on all these basic parameters when you combine with WMAP and be independent. So one of the things I think we will have um, when we finish this analysis um, is a completely independent set of cosmological parameters. And we'll either be on the Planck value or we won't be. And uh, you know, this is one of these cases where we have many things we need to do in the data. And it's one of these cases which I think really calls for, and in fact we're implementing a blind analysis plan. So I suspect that of order half of our team would like to see us bang on the, you know, half of the scientists like to clean up messes and half like to make messes. <laughs> so there's some of us who might want the value right on the Planck value, some who might want the value right on the, you know, to differ from the Planck value and perhaps be closer to the, uh, the local measurements. Um, but we don't want our, va our, our hopes and dreams to affect our analysis. So we're marching along, um, working on the analysis without looking at what it tells us yet. So none of us know yet what to see, but we have seen enough of the data that we think we will achieve um, our goals with the 13 to 15 data. And since we have more data for 16 and 17 that we're working on in the next analysis, um, I'm pretty confident we will have, um, you know, imp we will improve that part of the story. And we'll see. It's, it could be that these, when the error bars come down, the tensions get worse. Um, most of the time they go away. But after all, you know, we had similar situation uh, 20 years ago with our measurements of dark energy. And at the time we had a standard model, which was a much more beautiful model. It didn't have a cosmological constant. People had all kinds of good arguments why there shouldn't be one. And yet as the data improved, we found a growing evidence, really uh, most dramatically uh, evidenced by the supernova data, uh, that the dark energy was there. So the fact that we want to understand this is one of the things that drove the decadal survey to rank W first as its top priority. And there's a bunch of ways we're going after dark energy. And in this talk, since I can only cover so much, I really want to focus on the W first mission. W first in its current form uses a 2.4 meter telescope that we got from the National Reconnaissance Organization as part of a canceled program. The NASA is the United States' third largest space agency. Uh, the Air Force and the NRO both have significantly larger budgets. So for example, NASA has flown one 2.4 meter optical telescope in the past. That's the Hubble telescope. The NRO has flown about 15. And uh, they have, sitting in Rochester, an optical telescope assembly from a canceled version of uh, an older mission. But while it's older, it's much <laughs> newer than Hubble. So it has hubble size resolution with um, a much larger field of view, a field of view that's about 100 times larger. So basically, you should think of this telescope as take every time it images the sky, it gets a Hubble quality image, but a hundred times larger field of view. And in addition to this big um, camera, the telescope, we've also put, planned to put on the telescope a coronagraph that will be able to image and obtain spectra of exoplanets from super Earths to giants get images of degree disks, and we hope achieve contrast ratios of about 10 to the minus 9. Now I mentioned already, you can think of this as, you know, Hubble on steroids. Uh, for general astrophysics, you can think of this as every, when Hubble looks at the Hubble deep field, which has produced a wealth of science, that whole image has 10,000 galaxies. When we look at, with W first, we'll get a million galaxies. Now, I'm going to talk about W first results, um, our expectations for W first, 
What I'll be doing this, I'll be really conveying work that I'm part of as deputy chair of the science team, um, but something that really is the effort of many people. And in fact, if we start to have questions on things like the chronograph, which I'll get to at the, towards the end of my talk, if Bruce McIntosh is here, I can see Bruce, uh, you should actually ask Bruce sometime when you grab him in the halls, because Bruce is leading the science team that's uh, looking at, that's designing the chronograph. And overall, this has quite grown to be quite a large project with over 200 people on the various uh, uh, science teams. So how do we plan to use the telescope? Well, our design referent mission, which is our sort of going in plan, is to divide the telescope use into four big pieces. Um, a high latitude survey focused on dark energy that in its baseline form will cover about 2,000 square degrees, be a spectroscopic, also a spectroscopic survey um, for baryon acoustic oscillations, measuring distance that way, a supernova survey go, um, with a series of uh, different fields of different depths. So this first part of the program will be This is sort of our core dark energy program. And I want to stress it's going after the properties of dark energy in multiple independent ways. We're measuring distance versus redshift using supernova. We're measuring distance versus redshift using baryon acoustic oscillations. We're measuring the growth rate of structure using lensing. And we're also measuring the growth rate of structure using the galaxy surveys and the spectroscopy. And I think of this as an, it's really important to, to do both sets of measurements. Um, when I think about the effects of dark energy, it really comes in in two ways. If I, we go back to the Friedman equation, the Hubble constant depends on the evolution of the density. And then the distance to a given redshift measures the integrated Hubble constant. So I'm, by measuring distance to supernova and to the baryon acoustic oscillations, I recover the Hubble constant as a function, or the Hubble parameter as a function of redshift. Hence, learn about the behavior of the density of the universe. So I have my distance scale measurements. Then I have the growth rate of structure, which if I, this I get from looking at uh, general relativity assuming a uniform universe. Once I allow for perturbations, the growth rate of the perturbations depends on this equation, which again depends on the Hubble constant. Um, so, I can, well, we write, write this. In, so that if I have growth measurements and distance measurements, I should be able to derive a consistent Hubble constant. If I see these measurements not agree with these measurements, that points to the breakdown of general relativity. Or more likely the systematics of my data, which is why you want to make sure that you measure these things with minimal systematics and with multiply independent techniques, which is really the basis of the approach we've taken to designing the experiment. In addition to the dark energy program, we're also looking for, for microlensing to look at the statistical properties of exoplanets. I'll talk about that more towards the end of my talk. We're devoting about a quarter of the time on the telescope roughly to uh, a general, uh, what we, astronomers call geotime. This is you apply to observe a given part of the sky. You have com competitive programs. This is how the Hubble telescope operates. And then roughly a quarter of the time, uh, likely maybe a bit less, devoted to the coronagraph. As I've mentioned already for dark energy, 
we're combining a, a whole different set of probes, doing these comprehensive observations, looking at weak lensing growth, cluster growth, galaxy redshift space distortions, using H alpha to cover out redshift one to two with baryon acoustic oscillations, and then oxygen three lines let us push out to redshift three. So we have these overlapping ways of probing dark energy. And, you know, I think for the supernova, this really represents uh, kind of, you know, the ultimate uh, supernova survey. For weak lensing, it's a very important complement to what we'll be doing with LSST, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And uh, for BAO, it's really, uh, while we will be doing BAO surveys at redshifts less than about 1.2 with or 1.3 with DESI, this really represents the most complete survey we can do at redshifts one to two. And uh, to look at the, you know, we're looking at a much higher density of galaxies in Euclid. This shows the uh, number density of galaxies normalized to the amplitude of fluctuations at about uh, the baryon acoustic scale. This is what we'll do with W first and H alpha and oxygen three. This much higher number density of galaxies will let us not only use baryon acoustic oscillations, but also make much more accurate measurements of things like redshift space distortions, void statistics, and so on. So I think there'll be a, a wealth of things we can learn um, about structure growth with this much higher number density of galaxies. And this gives you a sense relative to the number density of galaxies you see in Euclid to what we expect to achieve, though albeit over less sky, with W first. The supernova survey, the current plan, is a three-tiered survey for low, medium, and high redshift supernova using the wide field instrument for discovery. And then we have an integral uh, field unit on the telescope that we use for follow-up to get high resolution uh, supernova and uh, spectrophotometry. Um, and uh, this should allow us to make half to 1% measurements of distance with uh, these 2700 supernova. And they'll be very well characterized because we'll have spectra as a function of time. Uh, the high latitude survey will be of interest both for dark energy and as a survey to complement LSST. This shows the expected five, point, uh, five sigma point source sensitivity for LSST with the expected angular resolution based on 10 years of operation. This is what we expect to achieve in the baseline survey with W first. This only overlaps if we go for four bands on 2,000 square degrees. Um, but we could consider alternative approaches uh, for thinking about dark energy uh, and going after the surveys. So just a little bit about how we plan to use the telescope. Right now in the design reference mission that we're using to design the telescope, we've divided up, for example, the dark energy survey time into uh, particularly planned uh, surveys of different depths because we need to set requirements to design the mission. The way that a number of us on the science team have now recommended to NASA to operate is a much more flexible program. So what we're recommending we do is during the first year that we um, have a planned program where we take a very deep field, for example, on the LSST deep drilling fields, a wider survey, the bold survey, a spectroscopic survey, spend th about three months on coronography, and use each of these surveys both to do science, but also to characterize how we can best use the instrument. We then want to take advantage of the fact that by the time we're completing this, these surveys in 2026, 2027, we will know much more than we know now. We will have several years of LSST and Euclid data analyzed. We'll have DESI data analyzed. And we'll see, you know, where are the discrepancies? Where is it, you know, do we, is it valuable to do imp 
uh, significantly improve baryon acoustic oscillations, then we'll take advantage of this big telescope and focus on BAO. Alternatively, if it turns out that the most valuable thing we can do is check the BAO measurements and the lensing measurements of DESI and LSST with a dedicated supernova program that gets a lot of observing time at higher redshift, we can do that. Um, my own, you know, we have these multiple, a wide range of, of bands we could cover. Um, my own favorite application comes from uh, some li our, our experience now with looking at LSST depths with Hyper Supreme Cam. So this image shows the Hyper Supreme Cam um, ultra deep field. Hyper Supreme Cam is a wide field camera on uh, the Subaru telescope. And this is to the depth of about uh, 26 and a half. So it's not quite LSST depth, and it's actually better resolution than LSST is expected to get on average. And you can see you know, both how exciting LSST data will be, because this is some tiny patch of the sky, and LSST will have you know, billions of galaxies actually at this resolution. And also, to me, uh, how challenging the analysis will be when we try to do precision measurements of lensing, because we're going to have to understand blending extremely well. And you can make, and you can see from this image, first, how important I think multicolor data will be for deblending, because there's a lot of information there. And, but even then, you know, if we're going to make tenth of a percent uh, measurements of, uh, have tenth of a percent control of systematics and shape, we better understand deblending extremely well. And we can't do the simplest thing of just throwing out the many galaxies that are blended. Um, so in, you know, DES already, about 30% of the DES galaxies are affected by blending. With HSC, we're up to about 58%. And by LSST, it should be about 63% of the galaxies will have photometry that's altered by their neighboring galaxies. And um, based on the Hubble fields, about 14% of all the LSST objects at LSST depth, um, you would not know they're blended. At a minimum, this is a source of additional noise, and having higher resolution data will help. At, uh, at worst, and this is certainly something we've seen in our uh, HSC work where we've looked at some of the blending issues, it can be potentially a source of significant systematic error that you'd like to control. Well, I don't think we'll know until we actually get the data. Um, the, let me skip ahead to this first and then go back at those slides out of order. My favorite application of combining LSST and W first, and this may be the right thing to do come 2027, is if we took six months of that observing time and took the wide filter band in W first, this is some work that Tim Eifler did, you could cover in just six months of observing time, you'd get enough depth that you'd have over 95% uh, complete for the LSST galaxies. And uh, you would be 99% complete if we took a significant fraction of the dark energy time and just covered multiple times the uh, LSST field, the entire LSST field in W band. And to me, this is just the kind of thing that we want to have the flexibility to do to decide whether we want to do multicolor imaging in the infrared um, or whether we want to rely on LSST optical and near IR colors combined with a single W first band when we want to think about ways in which we want to combine the data. And we'll imp improve significantly the deblending, but we'll also significantly improve things like the photometric redshift performance. So this is uh, some estimates of how well one might hope to do with uh, um, the photo Z's versus, uh, uh, based on some simulations. 
And this shows, uh, again, work from Tim Eifler, um, some of the anticipated improvement um, that we should get. Actually, this is, yeah, this is the one I want to show. So this shows constraints on W naught and its time derivative WA, where the green is LSST 10 year alone. The blue is W first if we did this multiband survey. If we instead combined the W first wide single band with LSST, our estimates are the red arrow bars here. So that the combination of both should do significantly better than either alone. And the combination most importantly increases the robustness. I mean, I think if we're seeing something intriguing in LSST, you know, we're seeing the universe torn apart in a big rip, we will, you know, the ability to confirm it independently with W first will be, I think, a very important complement. And another important uh, complement that we'll be able to do for LSST is our plan with W first is we've got this integral field unit that we're going to use for supernova. Now when we're doing imaging, we have to put that integral field unit somewhere. It's, and, our, and we have enough leeway because we've got such a big camera that we can always put the integral field unit in every observation on an LSST gold sample galaxy. So we will be able to get pretty high quality spectroscopy for uh, about 99% of the LSST gold sample. And uh, I think this kind of spectroscopic confirmation of the redshifts um, will, be ex will be quite useful. Um, we can do some of this with things like PFS, but as we get out to the higher redshifts, the IFU on W first really outperforms uh, uh, PFS significantly. So I've talked mostly about dark energy, but in the final minutes, I just want to mention some of the other science we hope to do with W first. The GEO program will really cover a very wide range of, of redshift ranges from the local galaxy out to studying uh, in the infrared the emergence of the first galaxies. And let me skip to, uh, ahead to what we expect to do with our ultra deep survey. And in fact, this is something that I anticipate we will likely want to do in our first year is take one of the, or, or more of the LSST deep drilling fields and go deep in the infrared. And based on current models, and we, uh, we estimate that we will discover thousands of galaxies beyond redshift 10 and even galaxies out to redshift 15 in the ultra deep survey. And this I think will be a very nice complement to the James Webb Space Telescope. We're basically a finder telescope for James Webb in terms of these high redshift galaxies. And what we will be doing, actually with all of our data, but certainly with the ultra deep data, is making it publicly available immediately. And this will, um, I think, enable the community to, uh, astronomers to then turn to JWST, turn to other telescopes, turn to the 30 meter class telescopes that will hopefully be on the sky around that time frame. And, uh, follow up on these high redshift galaxies. Um, we'll be able to test uh, different reionization histories, um, find these very high redshift galaxies. We should also be able to find a significant number of lensed um, high redshift galaxies. As, as we note here, about a hundredfold improvement on the number of known high redshift galaxies. It'll also be an extremely powerful telescope for galactic astronomy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are right now already have Gaia surveying our galaxy, getting very accurate positions for, for stars brighter than about 20th magnitude. When we combine that with W first, we will have accurate positions much deeper. Across every W first image, which covers a bit more than a quarter square degree, we will have several hundred Gaia stars where we know their positions quite accurately. 
that will tie down the astrometric frame of the image and let us get very precise positions for uh, a, a large number of much fainter stars in our galaxy allow us to determine distances uh, to white dwarfs, distances to other very interesting populations, for example, all of the uh, millisecond pulsars. We should be able to find their companions and get distances there. Um, and we should discover many very faint uh, dwarf galaxies and have the astrometric accuracy to be able to look at their internal dynamics. And I think that will be a very rich data set. Um, in the final moments, let me say a little bit about exoplanets. W first will characterize exoplanets in two very different ways. So in fact, I think of this as the two ways we tend to study populations as scientists. One way we study a sample is we get lots of data on, where we, um, on one or two particular objects. You know, we study individuals in great detail. The other approach is to get a little data on a large sample and understand its demographics. And W first is taking both approaches with planetary populations. So with the microlensing observations, we will be characterizing the statistical properties of distant and free floating planets. And with the coronagraph, we'll be imaging nearby exoplanets and planetary disks. So the Kepler mission has been quite successful in detecting several thousand uh, planets now around uh, stars within a couple, a couple kiloparsecs in the galaxy. And these Kepler planets all are at distances of less than the Earth's distance from the Sun. Kepler is good at finding things in short period orbits. W first will very nicely complement Kepler by detecting planets typically with separations around 1 to 10 AU and all the way out to the orbit of Neptune. In fact, if W first observed our own solar system as a microlensing system, it would be capable of detecting all of the uh, Earth, Earth, Mars, uh, some of the larger planets in the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And uh, not only that, they'll be able to detect these free-floating planets. This will be a statistical test, but we anticipate detecting several thousand planets and really completing the census of what are the properties of planetary systems. The way we do this is through microlensing. You have a lens star pass in front of a distant source star that amplifies the image. And when the planet passes between two of the images, you get a blip on the light curve. And uh, while this effect has been seen from the ground, the sensitivity from space is much higher. And you can get down to masses here. This is a simulation of a planet twice the mass of the moon at about 5 AU around a nearby star. This is not an ambiguous, this is a simulation. Uh, this would not be an ambiguous detection. It would be quite a clear detection of these planets and accurate determination of, it, of their masses. My favorite in this area are these free-floating planets. We if planet formation is efficient, then we anticipate that planetary systems will often eject planets. If you look at our own solar system and try to add a fifth planet between Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, you find it will get ejected pretty quickly within a few million years. And we may have had such a planet. In fact, in the Grand TAC model, um, it, a planet was there and it was ejected. Thus, we expect that there are significant numbers of planets wandering between the stars. And by measuring their abundance, we will determine the efficiency of planet formation. It, there could be 10 times as many uh, right now. We just don't know. In addition to the uh, microlensing work, uh, W first will be the stable platform for high contrast imaging. 
And uh, this will enable us to study uh, not Earth-like planets, but brighter planets and, and, and disks, and really push forward. Here's an, an estimate showing where we are today in terms of our ability to detect dim things around bright stars. This is the flux ratio relative to a host star. Here we are with Hubble, James Webb, pushing down with G uh, Gemini GPI and Sphere. We will make a several order of magnitude improvement, we hope, with the W first coronagraph and really make a significant step towards the detection of Earth-like planets around nearby stars. And looking at what we hope to achieve, here's where we are currently, there's a significant known planet sample that we'll be able to target. We don't think we will get as far as we'd like to be able to detect Earths around nearby stars, but this will be a significant advance in sensitivity and uh, give us insight into characterizing these planets. We are also with this making significant uh, progress in advancing coronagraphic dis uh, discovery. So this is a mission that was uh, the top space space priority for the decadal survey. It was endorsed in its current form, first by the Harrison Report by the National Academy and then in the mid-decadal. It was recently uh, evaluated uh, by uh, an independent cost review that Peter Michelson helped lead. In response to that review, we made a number of changes. The project two weeks ago went through its systems review and, uh, it, uh, and uh, was quite successful. It, it, we hope within the next uh, month or so to complete all the steps to make the transition from phase A to phase B. In terms of the project itself, it's all moving forward quite nicely uh, towards launch. The only obstacle we have in our way, and it's not an insignificant one, is the lack of support in the president's budget. Um, unfortunately, this uh, cut, which we believe came out of you know, OMB and the White House, represents not only uh, the cancellation of W first, but about a 15% cut in the astrophysics budget. The justification given in the uh, president's budget was simply the administration has higher priorities elsewhere and shifted this money from what has been the top ranked uh, decadal priority into the lunar science program, which was uh, unranked by the decadal survey. So one you know, thing that we've done, I think very successfully in the astronomy community over the last 50 years is a decadal survey program which identifies our top priorities so that the priorities are set um, by the scientific community, not by a, uh, you know, a handful of people uh, within the bureaucracy at the Office of Management and Budget. Hopefully, uh, Congress will continue to value the decadal survey. That has been the pattern uh, for many years. Our uh, initial conversations with uh, congressional staff and congressmen on the Hill um, are very positive. I am hopeful this will be restored and we will move forward towards launch in 2025. So let me stop there. Thanks. It's terrific to have this independent technique, and as you know, it comes out right in the middle, but with, from a single system, quite large on errors. So to plus or minus, I forget, but about 10. Um, and 
those uncertainties are actually, have a, a fairly non-Gaussian distribution. Um, but this is only one system. And it's doing, you know, it's a pretty powerful measurement from just one system. And given how quickly LIGO saw that neutron star merger, given how, when it was turned on, given that LIGO sensitivities are expected to improve, I think we can anticipate that within the next several years, LIGO will have tens if not hundreds, as we look forward to sort of this 2020 time scale, of neutron star, neutron star systems merger, measured where they have uh, optical redshifts. With that, I think we will have a measurement of the Hubble constant from LIGO as accurate as these measurements. And that will be a ver an important independent test. What LIGO will do is pin down the Hubble constant locally, independently. It will not be measuring, and this is something that people ask about, with, you know, even with advanced LIGO in its most sensitive form, it's not seeing neutron star, neutron star mergers at these redshifts. It can see very massive black holes at high redshift, you know, a relatively high redshift in this range. But the neutron star, neutron stars are down here. So the pinning down H is H over here. We will need techniques like baryon acoustic oscillations and the supernova to measure distances out here. Um, but the, you know, the LIGO technique is already becoming an important complement. And uh, you know, I've talked, there are other methods, um, you know, uh, gravita strong gravitational lensing has offered another technique that's a direct distance measurement. Um, those tend to get even higher values of the Hubble constant. You know, with, you know, uh, impressively, you know, the errors are getting smaller, but there's, those are all on the higher side, closer to the, uh, the, the ground-based supernova measurements. So, did I understand that a W of minus 1.3 would explain this? Yeah, it, get, it pulls up this value, but it actually doesn't do that well on the supernova here. So if you take the supernova measurements and let W float, they, it actually wants W close to minus one. So um, once you add additional data sets, they tend to right now drive you towards W of minus one, but it's all a little uncomfortable in the way the data sets um, don't quite overlap as much as they ought to. Um, and it's, it could be pointing to something profound. Uh, I think the conservative assumption is, you know, most experiments probably underestimate their errors. They're systematic, it's of various kinds we don't fully understand. Um, but that's why I think the way to go forward in all these things is just, we need to get more data, we need to get the next generation of experiments, and we're, we're moving forward on those. When you showed the breakdown of time for the first year of WPS, mm -hmm. how distinct are those observing times? Can you do transits and microlensing with the same observations, or are they really very distinct? Those are the same. Transits and microlensing are the same. They're the same. So that's yeah. the same amount of time. That's the, the, yeah, that's, you know, this is, um, oops. You can imagine um, optimizing the cadence more for one or the other. And we put all of these, uh, you know, this is a straw man proposal. And ultimately this will be selected, each of these programs will be selected by peer review with NASA, whoever's doing the selection, guiding it to make sure that the programs are designed to basically characterize the performance of the instrument broadly. The notion would be these would be selected, this first year pilot programs, um, probably early in phase C, so that we could develop the software needed for all those analyses and they'd be uh, made available. And uh, it's not necessarily the same observation. No, not necessarily. Um, and you know, in fact, You'll be doing the galactic, a lot of the galactic science off of the high latitude dark energy programs and so on. Um, you know, I think, you know, for the extra galactic, 
when we've talked about what different groups have asked for for their, their geo time. For a lot of the extragalactic stuff, you want to get an, uh, as deep a field as you can. So you know, I would anticipate we would have a proposal uh, from one or more groups to look at the, um, all the, the deep drilling fields. And those would be selected fairly early and I anticipate that we'd have lots of, you know, once you know you're getting that much data on the deep drilling fields, those become fields that people would target at many wavelengths. And they would also be the ones in which we would identify um, a lot of the targets for JWST. Uh, maybe one last question, Dick. Uh, yeah, uh, I hate to slip into politics in this august country, but being from Canada, we have a vested interest in W first. So, Maybe you could describe which nations are involved in the level of deep consultation of the White House. Yes. So one of the things that I think is really going to be essential to the success of the project is uh, significant contributions from a number of international partners. The Canadians are contributing towards the, most likely towards the uh, integral field unit, making a significant contribution there as will the French. The Germans are continuing um, hardware. Um, ESA as a whole is considering making hardware and contributions. The Japanese are providing um, a polarimeter for the coronagraph um, and also 100 nights of observing time on Hyper Supreme Cam, which will uh, enable um, some follow-up observations and some simultaneous observations from HSC. Uh, and um, one of the many things I've found myself doing in the uh, past month and a half is explaining to our foreign partners the intricacies of the American political system <laughs> and how the president proposes things. And even if it's, if it's his own party, uh, appropriators decide what they want to appropriate. And they will tell you they view the president's budget at best as advisory. And this is actually quite different from um, the way it works in most other countries. I mean, even at the level of the relationship between a parliament, when you're go usually when your party controls the parliament, it controls the whole government. And so I've actually found myself doing, explaining um, uh, first basic American civics, and then the more scary reality of how we, <laughs> We actually operate. Um, a positive form of this is actually that I think in many other places a decision made by the finance ministry to cancel something, which effectively is what this would be in most other places, would be very hard to reverse. But here we have uh, several members of Congress who are quite powerful who have said that they are eager to reverse it. And does we'll the international issue actually rise up in these discussions? Because uh, it, it used to be said that uh, the more international a project is, the more stable it was in America. That has been true in most administrations. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, maybe this, this, but it actually may be, you know, it is quite plausible that Congress will, particularly the House, will switch control in 2018. If that were to happen, the international nature of the project um, will be uh, helpful. The, you know, the, for the Democrats, that has always been important. Um, in most administrations, that has been important for the Republicans that was important during the Bush administrations. Um, this is an unusual administration. <laughs> Hate to end on that, but. <laughs> you know, the big rip would be worse. <laughs>